Good evening and welcome. I think we may still have some prickling in, but we're going to get started. Um, my name is John Lyon. I'm section head of the German department here at Carleton, um, or the, I guess the German section of the German and Russian department, excuse me. Um, I'd like to start out first by thanking many uh, people, first of all, to all of you for coming to this event, um, but also to those who made this event possible. Um, these include um, Kim Betts and uh, Sarah Rex Siegel from the Career Center. The Career Center helped sponsor this event, and we're grateful to them for the refreshments. Um, Mary Taja in the German department helped uh, coordinate a lot of the details here. Uh, Judy, Juliana Schicker in the German department is our social media expert. She's going to be live tweeting our event. Um, <laughs> uh, Professor Lydia Tang, um, the students from Berlin program, you'll see, have uh, shared some of their posters here um, for projects that were done this fall while in Berlin. So we put that in as little extra uh, information just to see some of the things you can do with German. Um, and then um, perhaps first and foremost, uh, Diane Bell, who will be on our program tonight, who got this whole thing rolling and um, connected us with uh, Consul uh, Tiefenbacher Hudson, who we're very glad to have here. Um, but we really appreciate your help, Diane, in making this happen. Um, I'm really excited about our event this evening. I'd uh, like to, um, I'm glad that you get the chance to learn on a first hand basis about. Um, how knowledge of a foreign language, and in this particular case, German, can help you in a career uh, later on down the road. We're first going to hear from our uh, honored guest, uh, Consul Krista Tiefenbacher Hudson. She'll be followed then um, by our two alumni guests, uh, Diane Bell and Eric Schwarzkopf. Um, and um, after that, um, we'll open it up for your questions. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them uh, before they speak so we get a little bit of an idea of who they are, where they've come from, why they're uh, qualified to talk to you about this. You'll see that they are all eminently qualified to talk to you about these topics. Um, but I do hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity to ask them questions, to um, talk with them informally afterwards. We're hoping to have a chance for informal in interaction where you can uh, make connections with them and find out more about things that they know that might be helpful to you. So our first speaker tonight will be our honored guest, the Honorary Consul of the Federal Republic of Germany uh, in our region, uh, Ms. Krista Tiefenbacher Hudson. Krista is the co-founder and managing director of Triple Inc., a multilingual marketing communications agency that was established in Minneapolis in 1991 as a division of Martin Williams Advertising. Her responsibilities include general business management and development as well as strategic planning and direction of multicultural marketing communication product projects in all major languages. She's managed <coughs> accounts such as American Express, AT&T, Cargill, Marvin Windows and Doors, Mayo Medical Laboratories, Mercedes-Benz USA, Pfizer Animal Health. These are all tiny little mom and pop shops, right? <laughs> Have you heard of some of these before? Um, St. Jude Medical and TCF Bank, to name a few. She's also directed pro bono work for multi-ethnic community-based initiatives such as the Coexistence Exhibit, Minnesota ENABL, and Rheinfest on the Mississippi. Um, she's a native of uh, Germany. She holds a master's degree in history, literature, and linguistics from the University of Stuttgart, where she also taught German. She moved to Minneapolis in 1982 and built a business as an independent consultant <coughs> prior to establishing Triple Link. She's a founding member of the German-American uh, Chamber of Commerce Midwest chapter, um, and she served as the chamber's president from 2000 to 2004 and is now its vice president. She also served on the advisory board for the Center for German and European Studies at the University of Minnesota. In 2004, she received the Federal Republic of Germany Friendship Award. In March 2010, she was excuse me, appointed to the post of Honorary Consul of the Federal Republic of Germany in Minneapolis with a consular district that encompasses Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and Western Wisconsin. Her responsibilities include promoting German-American relations and providing assistance to German-American citizens in matter, matters related to Germany. So if you're needing a German passport or other German documents, she, her office is often going to be the one you go through if you don't want to head out to Chicago. Um, a very useful person to know. With that, I'd like to ask you to help me uh, welcome Krista Tiefenbacher-Hudson to Carleton College. Turn this back on. And is it on? Yes. <laughs> well, 
thank you very much, John. And excuse me, I'm going to move this before I fall away. Thank you very much, John, uh, for your kind welcome to Calvin College. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here this evening. And thank you for coming on this cold winter night. Um, Calvin College uh, has a fabulous reputation, and not just because one of my favorite American politicians used to teach here. Um, I want to thank Diane, um, who uh, really uh, initiated this uh, program here this evening with me. Diane is a perfect poster child uh, for uh, how learning a different language can make a, different, a difference in one's life and one's career. Do you hear that yeah. echo? Yeah. Um, um, just turn off the I don't mind turn off the bells. <laughs> <laughs> like the other mics. Could be. Oh, turn off this yeah, one. It is off. It is off. Oh, it is off. Mm. Um, should we switch mics? Or just use the other mic? Uh, it, 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 That's okay. Do you mind holding? I'm sorry. Not at all. Yeah, it's a little irritating. Yeah, that's better. For you, probably more. <laughs> Yeah, as I said, um, Diane is probably a great poster child for a person uh, uh, who uh, uh, learned a, and studied a foreign language, German, uh, and, uh, and this decision had a great influence on her career and, and her life, and uh, she may have met people that she otherwise would never have met had it not been for the German language. Of course, you could say that for any language, French, Spanish, Chinese, um, or any other of the roughly 6,000 languages that are spoken around the world. So why German? Um, as the honorary consul, I, of course, have a special interest in promoting my native language um, but uh, uh, learning German is also very important for the connection between uh, our two countries, Germany and the United States of America. And uh, this connection, these transatlantic relations, go back many hundreds of years. Um, German immigrants came to this country before there were a United States of America, starting in 1670. Uh, they went to Pennsylvania and um, New York. And um, uh, the uh, uh, United States of America helped shape modern Germany. They were very influential uh, on how uh, the Republic of Germany uh, reconstituted, if you will, after World War II. So our two countries have a very long um, and very uh, intense history. Question, how many of you have German ancestors? Wow, that's quite a bit. <laughs> um, it's not surprising. Um, uh, the, the latest census showed that in Minnesota, over 37% of people are of, of German ancestry, and on a national basis, and that surprised me, um, uh, over 20% of people claim German ancestry, which makes Germans the, the largest ethnic group in the United States. Who would have thought? Um, it's not entirely obvious, and maybe that's why it came as a surprise, at least to me, um, the influence of German Americans in public life um, here in Minnesota and across the country started to wane during World War I, when people were literally burning Beethoven and eradicating German language and culture, which had uh, blossomed uh, quite uh, uh, well um, uh, in the Midwest and in other parts of, of the country. And whatever appreciation of Germany uh, remained uh, was almost lost with World War II and the Holocaust. So over the past 70 years, Germany has confronted this dark 
time in its history and moved on to become one of the most modern and democratic societies in Europe. It has once again risen to a position of economic, political and cultural leadership in Europe. In fact, um, when the US News and World Report ranking of the 20 best countries was announced at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland this week, Germany was once again ranked number one. That's for the third time in the last five years. The rankings are based on a global survey of over 16,000 people in 60 countries on topics like Oh, okay. Where is the not in the left hand corner? The left hand. It's in the yeah. slide. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, got it. There you can almost yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I'm not used to work without a mouse, so... so the, the arrows here we are. Okay. Um, here we are. So, so these are the criteria on which these countries are, are ranked. Um, adventure, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> citizenship, entrepreneurship, heritage, influence, movers, open for business, power, and quality of life. And this was the rationale for why Germany was ranked number one, and I quote, Germany is viewed as the overall best country. The home to Europe's largest economy is seen as the top country for encouraging entrepreneurship and is highly regarded for providing global leadership and caring for its citizens. Its leader, Chancellor Angela Merkel, whom both the Financial Times and Time magazine named as their Person of the Year in 2015, has actively led her government to confront some of the world's most pressing challenges, such as the Greek debt crisis and the waves of immigrants sweeping across Europe. Germany rose from the ashes of World War II to become Europe's foremost power and a world leader in many areas, not least of which is its economic prowess founded on its network of small and medium businesses known as Mittelstand. The country is seen as a model for the way in which it trains workers in apprenticeships following secondary school education." End quote. Of course, Germany also provides low-cost college education, and through its universities and scientific foundations like the Max Planck Institute and the Fraunhofer Institute, the German government funds cutting-edge research that tackles the big challenges of our time like climate change. Germany's popularity, uh, because in a way it's really a popularity contest, isn't it? Um, has also boosted the appreciation of the German language and culture around the world. Um, German, and that may be a surprising statistic, is one of the top three mega languages in the world today. Number one is English, number two is Japanese, and number three is German. Spanish is number six and Chinese is number eight. So how can this be when there are only about 100 million German speakers, native speakers, and uh, 1.3 billion Chinese speakers in the world? Uh, well, a mega language is defined not simply by the number of people who speak the language, but also by its economic value. The value of the economic transactions that are generated by the speakers of that language. So that's how German 
is number three in the world today. As John mentioned in his introduction, in addition to being the German consul, I also head up a multilingual marketing communications agency. So I know firsthand the importance of being bilingual or multilingual um, when it comes to uh, being successful in business. International business and trade is the bedrock of the German economy. And that is why Germany also is host to some of the largest trade fairs uh, in the world. Every year in April, the largest industrial trade uh, fair in the world takes place in the city of Hanover. The United States is the partner country for this coming Hanover Fair and President Obama will be there to open it. Companies from all around the world will once again sign millions if not billions of dollars worth of contracts in Hanover this year. While English is one of the official languages of the fair and most of the businessmen and women who negotiate these deals speak English as a second language, the American business people usually speak only English. Can you imagine how many conversations and thereby how many deals they may be missing? Language connects people, and that's why it's so important for people who are engaged in international relations, be they business, cultural, or political, to learn other languages. It gives you much greater insight into what motivates your international partners and how they think. When you study German at a college like Carlson, Carlson <laughs> I apologize. You will surely take a holistic approach to uh, learning the language, one that encompasses both the language and the culture, uh, and not just grammar and vocabulary. You can't access a culture uh, except through its language, but you can't access its language except through its culture. You have to understand both. As a student of German, going forward, you will have many opportunities to enhance your learning experience and understand that uh, Colton offers uh, a lot of exchange programs to uh, German and other language students already. Uh, there also are scholarships and exchange programs uh, and work study programs funded by the German government and other foundations um, that include both students and young professionals. By traveling to Germany, you'll have the opportunity to learn firsthand about German culture, geography, history, economy, and uh, the political system, and to explore uh, the different ways to live and work. And after you've completed your studies at Carlton College, you could even enroll directly in a German university. Uh, German universities set aside a certain percentage of their um, uh, student places uh, uh, for foreign students. Um, eventually, you will be able uh, uh, to decide on a career and looking at a career that pays off on all the energy and, and passion and time and money uh, you have invested in your German studies. And whether you are considering a career in business or science and technology or cultural entrepreneurship, here are some statistics that you may find interesting. Uh, affiliates of German companies create over 10,400 high-paying jobs in Minnesota. And for those of you who are interested, I have a um, 
document here, which is kind of a, a, a summary of Minnesota's relationship with Germany, that also includes a list of all of those German companies that do business here in Minnesota. Nationwide, German companies employ about 645,000 people, and US companies employ about the same amount of uh, people in Germany. Germany is the number one export market, European export market for, for Minnesota, and US exports overall um, reached about 42 billion worth of goods um, in, that was in 2013. German being the export Weltmeister, exported about twice as much uh, to, to the United States. But one thing that is almost more important than the export numbers, and um, um, something that is not often talked about in the media, is foreign direct investment both foreign direct investment by German companies in the US and by American companies in Europe and in Germany. And it's this investment that pays back big time. Foreign affiliates of US companies generated 46% of their total revenue of about 1.5 trillion in Europe. And of those 1.5 trillion, 90 billion were generated in Germany. That is more than in India and China combined. So, your chances of finding a career that allows you to use your trim language skills are pretty good. I may just be a little biased, but I think Germany is one of the most interesting and modern countries in Europe today. So I invite you to visit the website of the German Embassy, uh, which represents a great online portal for information about Germany. And from there, you can go to many, many different uh, German sites. Very easy to remember www.germany.info But more than visiting the website, I invite you to visit Germany because there's nothing like traveling and seeing a country for yourselves. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und wünsche Ihnen viel Erfolg bei Ihrem Studium. Thank you very much. Our Second speaker will be uh, Carlton alum Diane Bell, and Diane is a principal at Bell Marketing Group in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she helps global technical and engineering companies grow their businesses with innovative marketing and communication solutions. Uh, Diane graduated from Carlton College with a BA in German literature and the equivalent of a minor in Spanish. She also has an MBA with a marketing focus from the University of St. Thomas. Diane has a multicultural background. As a German-American, she spent significant periods of her childhood in Germany with her German mother and family. Additionally, she spent almost five years living in Caracas, Venezuela, where she learned Spanish and developed a lifelong love of arepas. Did I say that right? Okay. Um, following graduation from Carleton, she received a Fulbright scholarship to study German dialect literature at the University of Erlau in Nuremberg. Diane began her business career at Honeywell um, at their then headquarters in Minneapolis where she held a variety of sales and marketing management positions. Her tenure at Honeywell included three years at the German headquarters outside of Frankfurt, Germany, where she supported the German building controls business. Diane also worked for MTS Systems in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, a global supplier of mechanical testing and simulation equipment. At MTS, she held a variety of stra strategic marketing and communications management positions for MTS's ground vehicle testing business, among others. Diane lives in Minneapolis with her husband and two sons, where she's passionate about promoting the German language. Um, not only up there, but here at Carleton College. I really appreciate her being involved and wanting to see things thrive here at Carleton. She's really taken a genuine interest. Um, she's established an after-school German language program at Ken Kenwood Elementary School, the first of its kind in Minneapolis, 
at the elementary level, which is now in its third year. Her two sons attend the Twin Cities German Immersion School in St. Paul, where she's an active volunteer. Please join me in welcoming Diane Bell. Um, well, I want to thank all of you guys for coming outside, too, in this uh, cold and uh, snowy evening. Um, or maybe not as snowy as we'd like to have it, but definitely cold. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys will... Uh, actually, I should move on to my next thing. Because <laughs> the reason that we are here is because we want you to learn German. I think that message probably came across loud and clear. Um, and I, I like the fact that uh, Frau Tiefenbacher Hudson used Impossible Germany for the title of her presentation. Did you guys all get the reference to that? To the Wilco song? Just curious how many people were going to catch that. Anyway, um, <laughs> the reason that we're here is I really, as John mentioned, I am really passionate about German and uh, it's sort of had a, it's been waning over the past few years, which I've found to be um, surprising and I thought I'm going to do something about that because it's, it's a highly relevant language for you to learn. And as uh, Prof. Tiefenbacher Hudson pointed out, there, you know, the German economy um, you know, is huge, and there are, more, there are so many reasons why you should learn, learn German that we would probably be here all night. But anyway, the takeaway that I'd like for you guys to have after this is that you'll understand why German's relevant for you, what kind of career opportunities you could get from speaking German. And then if you're not already taking a German class, go out there and sign up for a German class. And if you are taking German, take some more so that you'll uh, increase your level of proficiency. Okay. So um, I thought what I would do is start out by talking about the career path of a German major, just to kind of illustrate how, how you can go from studying German literature to having a career in the business world, because it's not necessarily clear that you can make that jump. Um, and to start that out, I'm going to tell you a story that is very relevant to where we are sitting tonight. Um, because it's a, it's a story that illustrates, to my mind, the economic value of German. So back when I was a sophomore, this library did not look like this. It, it was much smaller and much older. And the college decided they were going to renovate and expand this library. And there's this huge um, construction project that took place starting in the summer after my sophomore year. And I was working on campus that summer in the post office, which as you guys all know is like the hub of the universe, and so I knew what was going on on campus. And the scuttlebutt was that um, as all the construction equipment was getting delivered here on campus to start the project, the core piece of equipment, which is a crane, um, a crane from Germany, because they make very good equipment, was delivered. And as the guys, the construction team was trying to put it together, they realized, oh my god, it's all in German. Um, and so here they have this high-tech, powerful German crane with the assembly instructions all in German. And uh, the threat of, you know, work stoppage was very real at that point. And if you know anything about construction, you know you don't want to be stopping because that's going to be cost overruns and you have an unhappy customer and an unhappy contractor. So luckily, Carleton is not um, some random shopping center. It's a university college that has a language department, including German professors. So, and it just so happened that one of the professors uh, was still on campus at that time and only lived a block away, and that was Professor Roger Paz, who just retired uh, last year. So he was quickly um, employed to translate the assembly <laughs> instructions into English so that they could get going stat on this construction project, thereby illustrating the economic value of knowing German. So not only can you translate medieval German literature, you can also translate uh, crane assembly manuals. So I think that's a really important story about you know, the value of a language period, but specifically of German, because as you guys probably all know, Germans are really good at building stuff. And so to that end, it's a useful language to know. So, uh, graduated in 1985, uh, I was a German major. And when I was a, a German major, uh, my parents' friends would always say, what are you going to do with that major? Are you going to be a teacher, or what are you going to do? And I really hadn't thought that far ahead. I just liked German, so I was just going with the flow. And then uh, something happened that was kind of interesting. Uh, when I was a junior, I went on a study abroad year, but uh, I went on an independent program. I didn't go on a Carleton program. And so what that allowed me to do, it was for a semester, the winter semester at the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg. 
And uh, so that basically covered fall and winter terms here at Carleton. And uh, the cool thing about that was that I actually got to take classes directly at the university. I wasn't taking classes from a Carleton professor, it was through the university. And um, I had a really uh, interesting experience happened right at the beginning of the, of the semester. I was coming back from Nuremberg on the train, and there was a, a German, older German woman coming back from the market, and she saw that we were American, and she came up and talked to me. And I had no idea what she was saying. And, and I spoke pretty fluent German. And it was, uh, that was an important moment for two reasons. One, it illustrated how important it is to be able to communicate. And here I thought, I speak German and she speaks German, but we don't understand each other because she was speaking the, the local dialect, which I didn't understand. And the second thing that did was make me really interested in German dialects. Um, so after I graduated, I ended up going back to Germany. I applied for a full right to study German dialect literature, which I still to this day find really fascinating that you can have hundreds of different dialects and somebody five kilometers away from you speaks totally differently from, you know, their neighbors. But anyway, that uh, I decided, however, that I, I didn't want to continue in academia, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I want to look for a job in industry because what else can you do with your language? Well, you, you know, the Roger Paz example shows that you can do something with uh, the German language in the business setting. So uh, I came back, and Honeywell was at that time headquartered here in Minneapolis. They subsequently moved, but huge global corporation. And uh, a friend of mine knew somebody in their international human resources department, so. Um, I was hired primarily because I had the German background, and that's what they were looking for, so score one point for Germany there. And the other thing that I realized when I worked for Heine was being a global company, they have offices in Germany, and I decided I really wanted to go back to Germany and work. I had family there, friends there, and I thought it'd be really cool to be able to go back and work. And so at a conference once, the general manager of Honeywell Germany came over, and I kind of boldly went up and introduced myself to him in German and said, I'd like to have a job in Germany, do you have any openings? And he was so flabbergasted, I think that somebody would come up to him and, and happen to be able to say it in German, that he said, sure. So I actually got a job. Uh, so I, I got to move to Frankfurt, or just outside of Frankfurt, uh, and worked for Honeywell there for three years. And uh, I had a variety of roles there. Um, and that was a really, uh, that was a, a key experience for me in my business life because among other things, obviously my German became very sophisticated, at least on a business level, which has stood me well um, ever since. But I also learned um, a couple of important lessons. And the first lesson I learned was that uh, all business is global. You have to think global, but you have to act local. And in this case, the acting local was in Germany, and I had a, a really interesting experience that cemented that for me. Uh, a bunch of people from the headquarters in Minneapolis came over for a, a big meeting. They were trying to get the German office to do something that the Germans didn't really want to do. I don't remember what it was, but I was in this meeting with my German boss and colleagues and this group of Americans, and the meeting was held in English, of course. And, uh, and then after at a certain time, we had a little coffee break, and the Germans broke off into their group, and the Americans broke off into their group. And I was in a, a unique position, because I could kind of straddle both of these groups. And I heard the Americans saying, yeah, I think we've convinced them. I think, yeah, I think they're going to do it, you know. And the Germans were like, no way are we doing this, but we're going to make them think we're going to do this. So <laughs> just keep nodding your head. And I was sitting there going, huh. You know? <laughs> so I, I think uh, Frau Tiefenbacher Hudson pointed out, you know, at the, at the trade show, how many business deals are you missing out on because you only speak English? You know, corollary here in this business meeting, the Americans had no idea that the Germans had no intention of going along with what their plan was, but they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But had they known German, they would have, they would have known that. So that was a key meeting, a key thing for me to, to grasp at that point. Came back uh, and worked for Honeywell here in the States, and ironically, I wasn't really able to do much with my German here because being a huge global corporation, they had people in Germany doing that. So they didn't need me here in the US doing what they have um, over there in Germany doing. So I decided to take that opportunity to do something which is to expand my toolbox, because it's all about expanding your skill set so that you, you're more marketable. So I went out and did what everybody else was doing. I went out and got an MBA. And that was useful because I, you know, having my liberal arts uh, humanities background, I was kind of missing some of those things. So. 
the uh, the MBA was definitely uh, a good thing for me to to, to do to, to bolster my my toolbox and to get some uh, practical or theoretical experience uh, in business. And right around that same time, I had an opportunity to go to another company, uh, MPS Systems, where Mr. Schwarzkopf here is going to tell you a lot more about in a little bit. But uh, the thing about MPS is that they, they too are an engineering company, but much smaller than Honeywell, on a much smaller scale. So the good news there was I could do something and leverage my German from an American vantage point without having to go live in Germany. And because they didn't have um, a huge infrastructure, they didn't have anybody at their German headquarters, which is in Berlin. And at the time, and may still be the case, Germany was the second largest market for uh, MTS behind North America. I don't know if that's still the case, but... Europe is huge, but Germany by itself isn't. Okay. But Europe is huge. But at the time, Germany was... Well, that's where the headquarters are, in Berlin. And so... If you wanted to do anything in, Ger in Europe, you had to go through the Berlin office. And so uh, I was working for the Ground Vehicles Division, which was the biggest division of uh, MTS at that time. Who knows what they're called today? They still make Porsches in Germany, so... Yeah, it's still there? Okay. okay. <laughs> but um, it was a really a great experience because I was able to put together marketing plans, uh, marketing programs and initiatives, and execute them and get the buy-in that I needed because the team in Germany accepted me. They knew that I knew German. They knew that I'd lived in Germany and worked in Germany. And I could get buy-in and support from them. And they were willing to, to do and execute the things that I was asking them to do because they also knew that I would go to bat for them. When they were saying, we need literature in German. I can't sell this thing with English. i got to have a brochure in German. I would make sure that we could have some money in the budget you know, and you know, get it printed in German. So the, but if I hadn't had that, that ability to connect with them, to get their trust and to get that rapport, it wouldn't have made me as effective in my position. And so the fact that I could speak German was an enormous asset to me personally, but also to the company. Um, in fact, the CEO of the company at the time, uh, right around that time, asked me if I wanted to move to Berlin and to actually take on an active role in marketing in Berlin, which I would have loved to do, but I had just gotten married and that was not gonna work with my husband. So, but the point is that, you know, I could have leveraged that into, uh, because the company saw the value of that. The company sees that, that, that there's an economic value to your language skill um, that the company can benefit from. And then after I moved out on my own, uh, with my own consulting group, I still work with a lot of small to medium uh, engineering and tech companies, and they're all global as well. And two days ago, uh, a former uh, MTS colleague asked me to help him do a press release for Germany. You know, so I'm, I, I'm still being able to leverage um, and differentiate myself because I can speak German. Um, so, as you can see, um, I hope, German is relevant. But, you know, German has really, I want to talk a little bit about the German language, because German has really gotten a bad rap. You know, people think it's a crazy language, it's <laughs> got 8,000 verb tenses, and you know, crazy sentence structure and you know words that are you know a mile long, and some of that is true. <laughs> um, but but the cool thing about German is so logical; it makes complete sense. It's like Lego for words. You just find the words you want, and you kind of click them together, and you've made a new word. Um, so this Fußbodenschleifmaschinenverleih is totally logical. It means floor sanding uh, machine rental. Of course. It happens to be 32 letters long, but you know. Uh, but you guys probably know a lot more German than you think you do, and it's not that hard of a language. You, you guys have probably all experienced angst at some point in time, or schadenfreude when the guy who cut you off at the red light gets a flat tire a block later. Um, and you guys probably even know what this means. Um, in fact, here's another, you know, Lego word. Volkswagen thought Americans understood it enough that they used this for their marketing campaign for several years, and it was very successful. So, you know, German is a highly relevant language. So, I thought I'd just share a few little statistics. Uh, I think it was just mentioned that it's, it's the official language, actually, of six European countries, not just Germany, but Austria, Switzerland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Liechtenstein also consider it their uh, uh, official language. And there are a lot of people who speak it, over 126 million native speakers worldwide, and it's the mother tongue of, of a quarter of all Europeans. Uh, third most popular language taught worldwide, and second most popular after English. 
and uh, second most commonly used scientific language. So for those of you who are scientists, presumably you already speak English, so if you learn German, <laughs> there you go, you're set. And uh, it's the third most widely used language on websites. So I hope that you can uh, see here that, you know, German is a highly relevant language. Now, it also really uh, complements STEM careers. And I don't know how many of you guys are in the sciences um, or techno technical people, but even if you're not, um, it, definitely, uh, it definitely supports a STEM, uh, a STEM <coughs> career. Um, you probably know that Germany's reputation as an engineering and manufacturing powerhouse, um, and there are a lot of achievements uh, that they have made in the sciences that kind of support that. Uh, I, I'm not sure about this, but German speakers are, if not the greatest, it's probably the number two uh, number of Nobel Prize winners. I mean, there's just, I had a list somewhere about how many German speakers have won Nobel Prizes in physics, chemistry, and medicine. It's a pretty big list. Um, there, as I think we just heard earlier, they're, they're a huge exporter of high-tech products. People like German stuff. They make cool stuff. It's durable, performs well, designed nicely. I mean, who doesn't want a Porsche? Um, you know, Germans are also legendary in their inventiveness. And this is a really interesting statistic. They're just slightly behind the U.S., but there's only about, like, 83 million people who live in Germany. Um, but yet they're almost the same number of patents uh, as, as the U.S. Um, they spend a ton of money on R&D and their high-tech products. Again, that's why they make such good high-tech products, because they put a lot of money and research into making them. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that they're right up there with renewable energy. Um, I saw a statistic that said they were the world leader recently, but this is second. Um, but apparently they are the world leader in solar photovoltaic panels. If you go anywhere in Germany now, you can't see the horizon for all the wind turbines everywhere. I mean, it's unbelievable. When I went to see my grandmother in uh, October, since I'd been there in April, like, they just pop like mushrooms. They pop up <laughs> everywhere from one visit to the next. So they're definitely embracing renewable energy. And where would Apple and iTunes be without a German, you know? <laughs> Uh, if we hadn't invented the MP3 format. Um, and it's one of the most frequently used internet search languages in .de, apparently is the most widely used country-specific domain. So clearly this, you know, their, their, uh, um, their powerhouse, the, the fact that their powerhouse is in, uh, in product development and in manufacturing and engineering means that they have economic might too. And as you just heard, they're obviously Germany, uh, Europe's largest economy, and clearly they're the, the main force driving the EU. Um, but they're also the third most powerful technological economy after the U.S. and Japan. And again, this is a country with, you know, 83, 84 million people. Um, we just saw some of these statistics about how large they are as, as our trading partner. Um, this statistic is uh, interesting. Of the top 50 companies, nine of them are German. You know, BASF, BMW, Daimler Benz. Um, these are all well known uh, mega corporations. Um, and you can see here how many uh, US subsidiaries. We just saw, I think, that information from Frau Tiefenbacher Hudson. But one thing I really want to point out here, and she mentioned it too, is this last bullet here about um, the 1,000 companies based in German speaking countries. The backbone of the German economy is actually, I believe, uh, what she referred to as the Mittelstand. And that's something that's truly unique to Germany. And these are small to medium-sized companies that focus on like one or two core products that they make extremely well. They tend to be family-owned oftentimes. And they, there are thousands of them in Germany. And the thing is, you have a real opportunity if you wanted to work for one of these companies because they don't have the luxury of having a big marketing department somewhere yet because, as I mentioned, all business is global, but you have to act local. They need people who can speak English because they have to be in the American market. And, and English is like the lingua franca of the world anyway. So they have to have somebody who speaks English, but they also have to have people who speak German because they're German companies. So to the extent that you can speak English and German, that's like an enormous asset for you um, as far as, you know, thinking of career opportunities. Um, and uh, be that working for them in Germany or working for them over, over um, here in the U.S. 
Um, that economic strength uh, means there are career opportunities for you. So I want to come back to something that I mentioned earlier when I was on the train coming back from Nuremberg and that lady came and talked to me and I, I couldn't understand her. Um, I assume you guys are all familiar with this guy. Um, C-3PO. So uh, right before Christmas my kids wanted to go see the new Star Wars movie and I thought okay well before I go do that I'm going to binge watch and go look at all the other ones because I had to remember who did what when. So I went and I looked at it. We watched all the movies together and, um, and I was struck by something. In almost every single movie this guy is the the guy that everybody wants. He's indispensable. You know, everybody's like, oh, can you speak Ooga Booga? He's like, yes, I am fully programmed with six million forms of communication. <laughs> and I was like, well, gosh, how come we all don't have a personal protocol droid? But think about this. In the 23rd, 24th, whatever century this takes place, they've got lightsabers and hyperdrives and They've got a Death Star that can kill a planet, but they can't talk to each other. You know, they still need droids to talk to each other. And, you know, the thing is, it's all about communication. It always has been and it always will be. You can't do anything if you can't talk to people. And given that Germany is such an economic powerhouse and there are so many opportunities uh, for you to work in a country like this, you have to know German. And it will, it will open up in a, in a realm of opportunities for you. Because as I said, everybody thinks global, but you have to, at the end of the day, act locally. And locally means in the language of the country where you're at. And in this case, we're talking about Germany. Um, and so C-3PO is indispensable. Well, if you speak German, that'll make you indispensable. Because your employer will see that you can, you know, you know slice and dice and make julienne fries. You know, because you can walk and chew gum at the same time. Employers want people who can wear lots of hats, who are multifaceted, multi-talented. Multi and to the extent that, you know, you can program and you, um, you're a chemist and you can speak fluent German, I mean, that's like an amazing combination or, you know, pick, pick your discipline. But the point is, you know, the fact that if you can speak, the, you know, German, you're going to have just a world of opportunities. Um, it's going to go a long ways towards reinforcing trust and goodwill with your colleagues and your clients. And as a, in that uh, example I mentioned when I was working for MTS, I could get buy-in and support from our team in Berlin because they trusted me. They knew that, that you know, I understood what they were going through. I, I'd been in their shoes and they knew that I would uh, go to bat for them. Um, and you also get the real story, like that example I mentioned when I was working at Honeywell in Germany and the, the Americans thought one thing and the Germans thought the other. So you can actually get the real story, and by getting the real story, um, you can uh, get a lot more accomplished. And you can save your employer money, or make your employer money. Uh, either way, uh, you know, the whole purpose of business, as one of my finance professors used to say, is to make money. And so whoever you're working for, whatever you're doing, they either want to save money or make money, and to the extent you can help them do that, you're uh, going to be indispensable like C-3PO. So, you know, as far as how does this translate into, you know, actual, you know, opportunities for you, obviously there's like a ton of companies in Germany there. Um, you know, the 21st century Germany, as Frau Tiefenbauer Hudson mentioned, is, is a, a very different place from the, the country that I studied in in the, the late 80s and lived in in the 90s. Um, it, as she mentioned, it's got unprecedented popularity. It's totally hip. You know, they've, they've got... Um, this crazy economic strength, and they've, uh, you know, they've got this uh, humanitarian largesse that they've been demonstrating, certainly with the refugee crisis right now. But um, Germany is also, uh, I read a statistic just yesterday that the German language is actually increasing in terms of uh, how many people are learning it worldwide, modestly, but it, it is increasing because it's a popular country. Um, it's also a trendsetter, you know, they're, they've decided to exit uh, nuclear power, and so they're embracing a lot of uh, uh, alternative energies, but a lot of other com com countries are following their lead as well. So they're kind of a, a hip, uh, hip green superpower, you know, as I mentioned, the leader in, in wind energy, uh, geothermal, uh, solar, they're, they're just leading the way um, in terms of that and with just amazing innovation, technical innovation. And Germany is also aging. 
they have they're a gray society uh, like a lot of Europe their birth rate is very low and as people are retiring they need workers and so to the extent that you're young you're embarking on your career now um, to the extent that you want to uh, work for a, a, a technical company possibly knowing German will uh, position you wonderfully for that because there's going to be a lot of job opportunity with these com these companies in Germany who are going to be needing to replace a lot of their employees as they retire. So in summary, um, just wanted to, if you haven't got the message, German is a valuable career skill, repeat after me. Um, uh, it, and you don't need to be fluent. Um, I, I am fluent, but you don't need to be. I worked with uh, one person at Honeywell Germany who knew nothing when he moved over there and he stayed for three years, and by the time he left, he, he was more or less fluent. But the fact that he was willing to try to speak, that he tried to learn, um, that bought him a lot of, of goodwill from his, his colleagues. Um, there's tons of opportunities in the 21st century Germany that are really exciting, that are really progressive. Um, they need the workers. And you can enhance your marketability by expanding your toolbox. So sign up for your German class now, <laughs> if you haven't already. So. Dankeschön. And our final speaker this evening will be Eric Schwarzkopf. Eric is a staff scientist at MTS Corporation. You've already heard a little bit about MTS, um, which is in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And as he described, it's a company that makes big machines that break things. <laughs> um, Eric was an MTS customer prior to coming to work at MTS in 1989. He first used MTS equipment in 1983 to design new nickel-based metal alloys and design thermal mechanical processing procedures for these al alloys. Um, he describes that as being a fancy blacksmith. <laughs> he has three degrees in engineering from Columbia University in New York City, a BS, an MS, and a PhD, along with an MBA from U the University of Minnesota with a technology management focus and a BS in physics from our very own Carleton College. At MTS, he's been a developer and a software development manager, a product manager, and a system engineer. Eric works closely at both the front end and the back end with sales, engineering, and product management to ensure that MTS provides products that meet the needs of materials customers. And he is also the uh, proud father of a current Carleton student, I believe, as well. He didn't put that on here, but we know that. So He's glad. going down back there. Okay, good. Glad we're continuing the tradition. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Eric. Okay. They stole all my jokes. They stole everything I wanted to talk about, essentially. Um, Frau Diefenbacher uh, Hudson and Diane have both talked about the idea that German is a... Do I need this? Can you guys in the cheap seats hear me? All right. Uh, they, they've talked about the fact that economically, Berlin, Germany, Austria... I mean, I, I put Berlin separately because I spent a lot of time there. Um, Switzerland and those other little countries, like, you know, what you mentioned, Liechtenstein, right? <laughs> and even the Battleworks company places, right? They all spend a lot of money, they all make a lot of stuff, they all send it all over the world. Sending it all over the world is sort of interesting to me. I mean, I've spent a lot of time wandering the world for MTS. Um, most recently, the most recent I spoke German elsewhere was last summer in Botswana and Namibia when I was bumping into German tourists. And once upon a time, Namibia was a colony of Germany, and there's lots of big animals roaming like the grass in Botswana. And so I bumped into these German tourists, and my family thought I was crazy because I'd go off and talk German with them for a little bit. Um, Diane mentioned that it gives you credibility if you can speak the local language. And I'm not fluent. I don't know how many of you are only going to take your four you know, semesters of a language and then get out, right? But I was one of them at Carleton. I was one of those guys that wanted to pass my requirements, my, you know, my, there were some things I wasn't really interested in, arts, uh, I wasn't really interested in languages. I needed to do these things, but I, you know, I picked and choose which ones that had the most interest to me. I was never going to be a painter, I was never going to be a sculptor. I liked to hammer nails at the scenery for the theater, so that was the arts class I took. I managed to pass out of out of three uh, trimesters of German before I came into Carleton, so I just had to take one more. Then I was done with my language. And part of the reason I was interested in doing all that is because I really wanted to be, I really wanted to be an engineer. I really wanted to be a technical dude. Um, 
Somebody wrote a paper out there that talked about MINT, which is the German acronym for STEM. Is that you? No, okay, somebody, I don't know, somebody in this room did that. And uh, I knew I was good at math and science, and I knew I wasn't good at other things, but I knew I had to be good enough at other things in order to get by. And I didn't want to be just a scientist or just a mathematician. I wanted to touch a little bit of everything. I wanted to, Diane talked about working between things. And when you work between things, you get to do a lot. You become indispensable. You can see 3PO did his thing because he was able to translate or talk to everybody else, right? Um, so I work between things. At MTS, I work between marketing and development and sales and post-sales service guys, right? Um, the guys who actually install the machine and make it go. Because I have a finger in each of those pots, and I'm, don't, I'm not trained in any of that stuff, really. And I got a little bit of marketing into the MBA, and I got a lot of science in the engineering. But I don't know anything about mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or software engineering. I'm a metallurgist. And a metallurgist is somebody who studies metals, who studies how metals work, how they're designed, the biology, essentially, of metals. Um, and engineers tend to force the metals to be the design they want them to be. They force not just the geometry, but they force the internal biology, the internal structure of metals to be what they want it to be. And that's what the blacksmithing part was. The blacksmith takes it out of the fire, he beats it, and he shoves it back in the fire, and he beats it some more, and he shoves it back in the fire, or he dunks it in the water. Cooling it and heating it changes the internal structure and changes the properties. Changes how strong it is, changes how resistant to cracking it is, changes a lot of stuff. Let me start this part right here. But let me tell you one more story before I get too deep into this stuff. The, the area that I'm most interested in metals is an area called fatigue. And fatigue is when you wiggle something to death. You guys have all broken a paper clip by picking it back and forth so you can shoot at your friend with the rubber band, right? So, so the idea is you have to wiggle it two or three or four or five times to break it. At the dawn of the Industrial Revolution was really 18... 20s, 1850s, 1880s, was really the first time you could get enough cycles or enough repeated loadings on things to cause something called fatigue. And there was a German railway engineer called Wuller, who, Augustus Wuller, I don't know if you ever know, learned this story or not. Okay. You can tell this one. He was a German railway engineer, um, and there previously, like probably in like the 1840s, there had been a terrible train wreck in Paris. Um, you know, everybody went out to Versailles to have a big party. They got, you know, drank the, the wine and ate the crepes or whatever else. And they all got back into these brand new, <laughs> brand new uh, train cars, right? Painted with, you know, this nice enamel paint and stuff like that, all wooden. And they locked it in because it was going to go really fast. It was going to go 20 miles an hour back to the city. Right? <laughs> and so they locked the doors, put everybody inside locked doors. And on the way back to the city, the engine broke, the axle on the engine broke. The firebox went down onto the ground. The train piled over the top of it. Everybody burned up. Major, major loss of life. It's like an airplane going on, right? So lots of people are dying. Everybody's burned up. Children are screaming. It's, it's terrible. So for many years, probably eight to 10 years, it was the biggest thing in Europe is to figure out why did this thing break and what made it happen, right? How do we fix it? How do we make it not happen again? Because all the bosses are worried about their funny below their jobs, right? So they want to make sure it doesn't break again and how we fix that. This guy named Augustus Willer, what he did is he, he had a, an axle, or he had a, a rod, and he hung a weight on it, and then he twisted it, and he just wrote, ran it around and around and around, and the weight pulled it down this way, and it ran over, pulled it down this way. And so this side is stretching one time, and this side is stretching another time. And so the stretching would sort of cycle around, okay? So it was sort of like pushing and pulling the rod. In his case, he was bending and unbending the rod. And that's what the railway axle was doing as it rolled down the tracks, right? Because the weight is in the cars and pushing on the axles. He found out that all the design philosophies that had been used up until this point, you know, they always made sure it was strong enough, it wasn't going to break because you put, you know, 400 people in the car and locked them in. But if you cycle it a bunch of times, like the paper clip, it broke after a while. And what they realized is that we have to worry not just about the strength of the metal, we have to worry about the fatigue of the metal. How, how many times can it cycle before it gets tired and breaks? So that was where my focus came from. Um, somehow I start this thing. 
And so I, I use German as a tool. Okay, I'm not good at it, but I'm good enough. Right? And, and as we'll see later on, MTS has offices and things to do in Europe, and I get to be one of the guys that get to do them. I started out at Carleton College. Here I ended up with freshman year fall term 1978, and I did math and German and writing and art and science and philosophy. And by sophomore year, I decided I really want to be an engineer. And Carleton doesn't have an engineering uh, criteria, curriculum, right? But Carleton did have this thing called 3 2. And what 3 2 means is that you spend three years at a liberal arts college, you get a BA, you have to finish all your, your requirements, right? You don't have to get all your, your, <coughs> you don't have to get all your credits. But I had to do my comps my junior year, and I had to take all the courses required to get a, be a physics major. Um, and then I went someplace else for two years, and I got an engineering degree also. So I got a BA and a BS. And when I was here, I lived in Goodhue and Myers, and I was an RA over there in Myers. Um, I cooked breakfast in Evans back when that was a, a, a breakfast place or a lunch place or a food place. Um, I was a physics major, and I was really interested in the structure of materials. I was really interested in how the atoms lined up. That's what, you know, that turned me on. So, was, so that's where I got the metallurgy bent from that part. And I left Carleton in the spring of 81, and I was a class of 82, essentially. I spent a lot of time in Ola. Then I went to Columbia University. Columbia U University has a school of engineering. It's relatively old. It's older than Carleton is. Um, the school of engineering really was a school of mines initially. You don't think about mining in New York City, but, you know, they got some holes in the ground. Um, and, the, and actually, the guy who funded the school made a boatload of money down in South America and gave uh, Carl to Columbia a, a bunch of money and they named the school after him. Now it's called the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. I think it's a politically correct name, right? It's, it's oriented towards climate change and global warming and things like that. Um, got my BS, got my MS, got a doctorate there. The doctorate required an engineering language. And as they mentioned, German is a scientific language. And so I had to refresh my German in order to get my doctorate. I had to translate some scientific papers, so I had to learn some new, new vocabulary. Right? Um, one of the things that intrigued me, I mean, this is the, Columbia was called King's College once upon a time, and so we got a crown. The School of Mines has the, uh, the pickaxe and the hammer. And um, let me just keep going through this real quick. This sign is from the Harz Mountains in Germany. Okay, Germany has had, you know this place, or you know? I'm from there. All right, very good. I was excited, right? So the Harz Mountains. This is a this is a story, right? This is a, this this talks about a silver mine. A silver mine that's been around. You know, it was first started in the in the mid 16th century or something like that. It was in the books. You know, it was on the the land grant books or whatever they had in 1592, and it was producing silver until 1773. So there's there's old engineering technology in Europe old engineering technology in Germany, and I sort of like the idea that these hammer and pickaxe are sort of similar to these ones over here. Made me feel at home. When I left Columbia, I had a job offer uh, to do jet engines in Cincinnati for General Electric, and I turned them down. They were going to lock me in a lab, and I didn't really want to do that. Right? I had the opportunity to do special main engines uh, in Los Angeles. They were going to make me a, a scientist on top of the mountain where they fired off the jet engines, or the rocket engines. And I thought that would be a really cool job. Well, my wife wasn't really interested in going to Los Angeles. Um, but I could say, yes, my rocket science. Oh, I guess it is a rocket science, right? So, <laughs> um, and ended up at, oh, I, what I knew was this part down here. I knew the materials, OK? I knew the, the pieces that things are made out of. I didn't really know the elements or the structural details or stuff components. I didn't know anything about making an airplane, right? But I knew this stuff down here. Um, and so what I ended up doing in the end is I ended up going to a place called MTS, and MTS is in Eden Prairie up in the cities. Um, it's this bucolic little place and with a little pond in front, deer periodically wandering through the, not as many anymore because there's a lot more people in Eden Prairie than there used to be. But 25 years ago when I started, you get a deer running through there about every month, right? Running across the grass. MTS has offices all over the world, okay? The red ones are where we have manufacturing. Uh, Paris, Berlin, something outside of Milan, um, northern Italy. I'm not sure where this one is, right? And uh, uh, 
So it starts with a G in Sweden. Gothenburg. Gothenburg, that's right. Um, like Diane, they asked me to go to Germany to be sort of a, an intermediary between the Americans and the Germans, because that was our, really our biggest secondary plant. Um, and I didn't go either for a variety of reasons. Um, but we also got stuff in Asia right now. Right now, MTS is selling a third of their stuff in North America, a third of their stuff in Europe, and a third of their stuff in Asia. But almost all the people are Minnesotans or, or North Americans. How many of you guys, okay, if I say the sentence, I'm going to go to the store, do you want to come with? Does that sound strange to anybody? Okay, you're not Minnesotan then, right? Because <laughs> the German language puts that mitkommen, you know, kommen sie mit kind of thing. The mit goes on the end, right? Um, and I grew up, grew up thinking, that's how it should be with, you know, want to come with you, always end the sentence with a bit, right? <laughs> and I get to the East Coast and people just laugh at me. But, so there's a, I mean, the ones who raised their hand earlier by having some German heritage, I'm only a quarter German, the other three quarters are Norwegian, right? But with a name like Schwarz, Schwarzkopf, mein Lust ein bisschen Deutsch, right? <laughs> For those of you who don't speak German, my name is Blackhead. <laughs> and you have a kind of luck, Schwarz Haar, right? Mm -hmm. Have a kind hair anymore. <laughs> um, different story. All right, uh, let's see if this works. Oh, there's supposed to be some music and sound. Well, anyways, there's some people on here that talk, and three or four of them say "Welcome till MTS" or "Welcome by MTS." This one right here is one of the Deutschers. <laughs> Can you push the, the ice on there, the, the loudspeaker? No, nope, that's okay. There's a couple, there's one uh, in Pawlowski in here, and there is at least one or two in, uh, I think two in Chinese. She's Chinese. She's speaking in Chinese. She's Deutscher. I know this guy. <laughs> He's hardcore Minnesotan. He's another hardcore Minnesotan. <laughs> She's the, the, the Russian. This next video is not going to be too much either, but we'll play it a little bit. Essentially what it does is it shows some of the things we make, and it has some guys talking about why MTS is a cool place for engineers or STEM types. How many of you people are even thinking about a STEM major? OK, that's not, that's not a bad number. They're all a little bit nervous to say that in front of the bosses here, right? Um, working between is the right answer. And so if you have something and you have other things, you can try to figure out how to make a place between them. And you're much more resilient to downturns in the economy. You're much more useful to people when things happen, right? So when they're looking for the guy who has to go, it's probably not the guy that can do multiple things. So it's just one way to... One way to, to have some control over your career. This kind of machine was what Diane was working on, that one that was shaking the wheel of the car. So rather than driving the car on the test track for two or three weeks, they put it on the machine and they shake the crap out of it for a while. One of those is a pipe bender. This one is to simulate spinal stuff. So in the future, how many have a grandma or a you know great uncle or something like that with a fake hip or a fake knee? And okay. So so the idea is that. You're, going to have, you're not going to have fake, fake spines, but you're going to do correction on your spine or, or put some screws in there to make sure the pain goes away, to hold it in place. And one of the problems with that is that you can't bend over, you mess up your golf swing, all kinds of other stuff, right? And so what they're trying to do is trying to figure out how you make sure that you can, you can get the right equipment to go into your back or get the right equipment to go into your hip. Because once you put one of those things in, you don't want to take it back out again. You don't want to have to replace it. You don't have to. You want to make sure they last until they're done with it. Grandma's done with it, right? So, <laughs> some of these guys are the new engineers. They're talking about what they like and you know what they get to do. They get to do lots of different things. Is what they're saying. Um, and at one point, they talk about having the subject matter experts around, and that's where I'm in there, because I'm one of the geeks for fatigue. I'm one of the hardcore scientists for fatigue later on. Yeah, so he's oh, yeah. me talking, right? These other two guys, uh, this guy over here uh, is a native Chinese speaker. And he does almost all the work in China these days, so I don't get to go there anymore. Um, but I still get to go to Germany and Europe. 
and I still get to go to Japan. I was last in Japan this fall. It's been about uh, 13 or 14 months as a, since I was in Germany, but I was um, on the Ruhr. I was in Berlin and on the Ruhr. Uh, the, 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 the place of dark beer. Dusseldorf, right? Yeah. Uh, about in November, a year ago. And I sort of, you sort of, in Germany, you can sort of tell where you are by looking at the beer. <laughs> oh, it's fuzzy, I must be in Munich. <laughs> oh, it's clear in little bitty glasses. I mean, Cologne today, right? <laughs> the reason we break things is because things break, right? This is a World War II liberty ship. Uh, the, once upon a time, back in World War II, they used to they load these things up in like three days. They would make these ships, they would weld them together real fast, Rosie the Riveter and people like that, and they'd send them off with, with goods for Europe. And they disappeared. You know, they, everybody thought the U-boats were getting them, right? Finally, one of them broke in harbor, and they realized that they welded them from the wrong steel. The steel was good for strength, but not good for cold fracture toughness, which when you t sent it on the, the northern route to Europe, it was the, the U-boats were getting some of them, right? But the icebergs, or just the cold weather was taking a few of them out too. And that's the issue. Um, when jet engines came along, they hadn't really figured out yet, when they pressurized and depressurized the cabin back in the 50s, how big the windows should be, or you know, how hard you might land one of these things, or stuff like that. This is a 1970s accident, failure. It landed, right? It didn't fall out of the sky. It hit the ground and then it broke. Um, this one is from the Aloha Airlines incident in Hawaii back in the 1980s. This one landed also. The only person that died in this was a stewardess, so wear your seatbelts. Right? I'm sorry, flight attendant. But where are your seatbelts is the answer. Um, she was you know, serving coffee to first class and, and got taken right out. Um, the issue here was cycles, because when you pressurize and depressurize and pressurize and depressurize, that causes wear on the airplane. Hawaii has very short flights between the islands. So the design criteria for most airlines is a couple of hours in the air for each flight. Right? So you can't get too many flights in a day. In Hawaii, you can get 10 or 15 flights in a day, because they're only 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and you get to turn around and go back. And so this had a lot more cycles than anybody had planned on it. And the top blew off as a result. Um, try and get this to go on the next one. Some of the accidents, some of the things that break are pretty mundane and pretty boring. This is just on the freeway outside our factory, and so we went out and took pictures of it. But essentially, it's, the, the idea is that you know somebody welded a little hook there so they could tie the bungee cord off to it. And the crack started someplace, found the weak spot where the hook was welded on because he changed the metal structure by welding it on there, mm -hmm. and grew right through it. <laughs> Made for a bad day for the driver, but nobody was dead. So how do we work with Germany? There's a bunch of trends over the last 25 years. A bunch of trends in Europe in general, and Germany is smacked dab in the middle of it, partly because it is an economic powerhouse. The fall of the Russian Empire is a big deal, right? Eastern Germany, or you know, East Germany, the Ost, Ostdeutschland, you know, the DDR kind of thing, it all came about as a result of that, partly. Um, another piece of that same thing is that places like Belarus and Ukraine split off from the rest of Russia. Um, and Russia has been providing, or has had, oil and gas, and has been providing that to Europe for a long time. When it had to go through places like Belarus and Ukraine, which were like Moscow, or like the rest of Russia, poor for a while, because all heck broke loose when you got rid of the, the centralized planning. So those are all, everybody was poor for a while. Everybody was worried about where their next meal is coming from. People started swiping the gasoline, the oil, the, the gas, the gas, natural gas, the oil, and the other things in the pipeline on its way to Europe. So you put in 10 gallons, you only get five gallons out in Germany, right? And because somebody siphoned off the rest of it halfway through Ukraine or halfway through Belarus. So Russia started trying to figure out how do we get around that, and one way is to invade Ukraine, but that's not their first choice. It's a, that's probably their choice for another reason. Um, one of the other things they did is they nationalized a lot of the oil and gas in Russia. When I was, I took the Trans-Siberian Railroad across Siberia back in 2004, and one of the things I noticed is everything was moving east towards towards China. There was lots of oil going east, lots of lumber going east, lots of you know, tree trunks going east. 
on freight trains in this little passenger train I was on was going west <coughs> towards Moscow. Um, a lot of the oil trains going east were named or had the words Yukos on them in sort of alphabet, but you know, the idea of Yukos. It was like two years after that that the, that the oligarch in charge of Yukos uh, was arrested, tossed in jail. His company was taken away from him. His company was sold to Gazprom, which is the, the gas natural gas company controlled by Putin and his buddies. Um, and that's the one right now that's sending, sending a lot of gas and oil towards, towards the Western Europe. And they're in the process, and I've been working with guys in Russia, uh, they're in the process of trying to figure out how do you put a pipeline underwater? How do you put a pipeline underneath the Baltic <coughs> Ocean? And how do you put a pipeline across the Black Sea in order to get the gas and oil directly from Russia to Turkey or to Kaliningrad or to uh, the northern part of Germany? Uh, without it getting lost in between, right? And you have to make a good pipeline because underneath water is, it's not, it's not really easy to fix one underneath water. Other things that have been going on, uh, it was 2011 was a tsunami in Japan. There's been earthquakes in Japan forever, you know, but, but the idea is the tsunami one took out the nuclear reactor at, at Fukushima. And that caused a lot of people to reevaluate uh, nuclear power. Germany, decided they didn't want nuclear power in Germany anymore. France, on the other hand, just across the border, has got like 57% of their electricity uh, generated from nuclear power plants. So EDF, Electricity de France, I think, was, I think that's what EDF stands for, has you know, huge amounts of power plants, and they're very good at, at making the power safely. Um, Germany is shutting down the fewer power plants it has. The one that I knew about was the one close to my ancestors' home in Neckarbestheim, which is not too far from Frau Diefenberg. Diefenbach. Oh, Hudson. Hudson, thank you. That's <laughs> that last name. Um, not far from where she, she lives, uh, or lived. From her home area. Okay. Um, but in so doing, they've done, as was mentioned earlier, they've done a lot of work with green energy, a lot of work with renewables. Not just solar cells, but also on the northern end, lots and lots of windmills. And the windmills are not just little bitty windmills. They're, not, they're much bigger than the ones that you have. For the two that Carlton has or the one that St. Olaf has, I mean, these are, these are big boys, right? Um, and, and when you move a blade around that far, when the blade is that big, you have more engineering problems you have to deal with. So MTS has been, not me personally, but MTS has been involved in a lot of that windmill testing or testing both the, the rotor, you know, where all that force is generated, and the blade structure itself. Um, someplace in here, I talk it down at the bottom, cars and airplanes. Um, Boeing has a big factory in Hamburg. I'm sorry, uh, Airbus is a big factory in Hamburg. Um, both the Airbus 380 and the Boeing 787 are made out of composites like the windmill blades. Uh, the cars right now coming out of Germany and some of the ones in the United States are all lightweight. They're all, they're all being made from things that aren't steel anymore. Once upon a time it was Ford Tufts, you know, steel and, and that kind of stuff. GMC trucks are made out of steel, so they're strong kind of thing. Now Ford is, is advertising military grade aluminum because the Ford F-150 is now made out of aluminum, which is, you know, helps, the, the, helps it be energy efficient. It, totally changes the way you put the doggone thing together because you can't weld aluminum the way you used to weld steel. Right? And so there's lots of work in how do you connect these new lighter weight materials together, how do you use less energy, how do you fill in the holes when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And the area of filling in the holes is where I've been working on in Europe. So we mentioned, we mentioned oil and gas pipelines. Bad things happen when they break. Right? You don't want that to happen. The way you fill in the holes is with steam generators or gas turbine generators. So these are just the blades from inside a generator. And what happens is the hot air or the hot steam hits one of these blades on the way through. It goes through the middle and it goes out this way and it makes the thing spin, right? And when it spins, it can make electricity for when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. So the other area we've been involved in as a company is, come on, is this area right here. So not just the blades, but also all this stuff right here. Because these blades sort of twist back and forth in addition to spinning. 
because the wind blows differently on the top side versus the bottom side. And that causes all kinds of havoc. And you don't really want one of these things to <coughs> fall apart up in the air there because it's a pain in the butt to fix. You want to make them last longer than they, than they currently do. This is the kind of machines I live on. And so we put something in here and rip it apart, and that helps us figure out how to make other things work better. This is a big machine. But sometimes you have big things you're trying to break. This is, an air, this is a Boeing panel from an airplane, from the, air, from the 787. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to test, you know, if we got a window in here and we got these stiffeners on here, how strong is this composite? How strong is this fiberglass aluminum composite kind of thing? Lots of university stuff. Not necessarily here, but you know, engineering universities. This is an example of a all carbon fiber monocoque for a car. So this is the kind of stuff that Porsche is using. Right now they're expensive, right? So you might find them in a Beamer, you might find them in a Mercedes, you might find them in a Porsche. This one's a Lamborghini. Okay, so it's in Italy playing with those guys, and, and this is a picture I got from them. Uh, and then, let's see if this shows anything. Yeah, so then finally, what's coming up in the future? And Diane mentioned aging population, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Is replacement parts. I don't know how many, how many of you folks ever saw the Six Million Dollar Man. It was back in the, you know, it was, it's, there's a couple of gray hairs that remember this stuff, right? But it, was a, it was a TV show back in the late 70s, I think. Probably about, maybe mid 70s. And it was about a guy who had bionic arms and bionic legs. He could run real fast and things like that. And he had a friend, and she was the six minute dog woman, right? And so she had uh, bionic ears so she could hear things. Bionics are not that far away. I mean, you know, Grandma's got a new knee and a new hip. It ain't that far away before you start replacing things. And some of the applications are going to be military first. You know, you're going to have guys who are loading trucks with, you know, like the alien movies. You know, was it the alien that did this kind of thing? Okay, and on the spaceship they had some, some, some robot kind of things you stepped into. You could load, load stuff around with it. Those, those, are, those are available. They're just a little pricey right now. But that kind of stuff's not that far away. Um, and figuring out how to size that correctly for people or how to marry that organic and that inorganic stuff together. It's probably a medical device area that's going to be very interesting between the U.S. and Germany. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We should ask. We should answer your questions if you have any now, because we've been over time, way over time, actually. So, yes, Kim. I, not a question as much as just making sure people know that in the Career Center we've been working with some of these folks to pull together opportunities for internships in Germany. So I have a stack of these if you're interested in thinking about that. Um, also know that there's some funding available too. So um, you can apply for funding through the Career Center. We've got some resources for looking for internships. So think about some of what you've heard tonight and how great it might be to do an internship in Germany over the summer. I'll leave these here for you to pick up. And internships are a really big thing in Germany. I think a lot more than in the United States that German companies proactively look for students to come and work at their companies, especially like the Mittelstand, because then, then you come into these smaller companies and you're kind of like part of the family. And they spend a lot of money and time in training you specifically for what they do. And then you in turn, you know, while you're studying and, or, or getting your degree, you can work part time, and then when you finish, then you get a job working at that company. So it's a it's really a big part of the German culture is you know doing internships at, at companies. So I definitely take advantage of the opportunity that Kim was just mentioning um, if you're interested at all. Other questions? I have a question for Roti from Bachar Hudson. You mentioned the different. Uh, business connections here in the Twin Cities area. Mm -hmm. If a student wanted to get connected to one of these German companies, how would they go about doing that? What would be paths in that pursuit to be connected to some of these German corporations? Uh, I think the most straightforward way would be to just contact the company. I mean, um, I will leave this um, uh, dark, these, these copies here that include a, a list of both German companies that have offices here in Minnesota and uh, 
Minnesota companies that do business in Germany, including MTS systems here, uh, with you, and and you could do the research um, uh, to see what do these companies do. Is that company a good match for what I'm interested in uh, as a as a possible career path? And then simply reach out to their HR director to find out if they offer internships. And the fact that you know you could combine your German language skills with another area of interest, whether it's in engineering or marketing or finance or human resources, um, I mean, whatever field, um, and it, it could not even be something that specific, but they, uh, they, they uh, I think, would be very open uh, to your applications. Most of these companies here as well offer, offer summer internships or maybe even other internships that are more structured or, or over the course of, of the year. So um, I think uh, uh, going to Germany, I think, is, is great. If you don't want to go quite as far, I think look at what companies have to offer you in, in Minnesota. We, we don't have, um, we don't have a, a, a kind of a, a program that facilitates that. We just don't have the resources. Um, so that's why I'm suggesting just the direct, direct approach. Other questions? Okay. I'm seeing the hour is late. And so before we go, um, I want to say thank you to our guests for coming and visiting us at Carleton. And so, we've got three packages, but they're all like, they're all the same thing, they're just, they were just wrapped differently. <laughs> so, I'm going to give the gift bag to you, a little memento of Carleton. Uh, and I'm going to give a box to Eric, because he can break it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anybody can help him. Just little mementos of Carleton to say thank you. Yeah, for coming here. Very much. Please join me in thanking him.